Hey, Keith here with Rebel Civics. Today I'm going to talk about 2022, what's happened, and um, from a from a civics perspective. So I'm going to focus on uh, the civics nature, the good, the beautiful, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, there's some of both. And uh, I made a list looking at civics topics, and I got more good than bad. So you might be happy to find out my list of civics-related issues. Uh, it was a good year overall in total. But I'm going to start with the bad. Uh, the bad is easier. Um, and everybody likes talking about the bad. So uh, I got a couple articles I'm going to start with. One is this whole the war, the American empire and their wars. Uh, everybody's been hearing about this a lot. Um, World War III hasn't quite got started. So I guess uh, you could say that's a good thing. Um, they're trying really hard, but they didn't start it yet. So uh, this is this is an article that uh, I wrote. Shameless plug for me. Um, will they successfully start World War III? I wrote this the day that uh, the Russian military moved into Crimea on their way into Ukraine, counting Crimea as part of Russia now, uh, and also into the Donbass region. Um, at the time, I thought they were going to start World War III uh, by now, uh, but they haven't managed to do it. Um, so that part's good. But, you know, the U.S. government has spent somewhere in the neighborhood of one hundred and eleven billion dollars so far on this proxy war uh, with Ukraine uh, in 2022. Uh, that happens to be more than the entire Russian military budget. Um, but it's certainly far from the U.S. military budget. That's upwards of seven hundred billion. So there's another uh, six sevenths of the iceberg uh, is not in Ukraine uh, that they're spending right now on the ongoing wars. Uh, we got the one in Yemen, of course, um, that's still going on. Uh, we had a war powers resolution. That's good, but it failed. In the spring, there was a war powers resolution about Yemen to say that we're not allowed. The United States military is not allowed to fund and assist and support and provide tracking information and targeting data and send weapons and help maintain the planes and do routing and communications to assist our buddy Saudi Arabia, one of the worst corrupt evil governments around, um, but one that we fund quite a bit. Anyway, there was a war powers resolution. There was one in the spring with a whole group of, of congressmen, senators. Uh, and then uh, even Bernie Sanders tried in December with another war powers resolution to say that Congress has to actually declare war before uh, they can go to war. Uh, now, those bills both languished. Uh, and I have uh, one here. Here's uh, that's the wrong thing. Um, the uh, the Senate bill here. Um, they were saying that uh, oh, this is the um, read the bills act. Oh, that one I have towards the end. OK, I'm going to go back to this Ukraine thing. So uh, this is where that is. So, yep, don't trust don't trust the government with their wars. There's a lot of ongoing wars. Uh, there's also one in Syria that's going on. There's one in Iraq. Uh, depending on you count, how you count, there's something like uh, a dozen wars or so ongoing. Um, the next thing I wanted to bring up, the uh, the omnibus bill. Um, we got a uh, $1.7 trillion ass kick to the taxpayers closing out the year. Uh, President Biden uh, found a pen in his signing hand and he signed that. Um, it's kind of a happy new year. So I just kind of look at it like President Biden. He discovered a pen in his signing hand and he approved this one point seven trillion atrocity. Um, it passed almost entirely along sports team lines. Uh, the House voted two twenty five to two hundred one in favor of this particular ass kicking. Um, representatives of the people, of course, is sarcasm. You know, the noble elites observe the uh, sporting team rules, so they remained with their team. Uh, the team red, um, they voted uh, in the House 200 against nine in favor. So if you got a red shirt on, you were told to vote against it. If you got a blue shirt on, you're told to vote for it. Uh, same deal in the House, in the Senate. Um, I happened to check my state, Florida. Uh, all 16 of the red team members voted nay, as they were told, and all nine of the blue team members voted yay. Anyway, it passed. Uh, so there's another 1.7 trillion. Uh, this picture of Rand Paul is priceless. In a thousand words, I couldn't express how disgusted I am with this bill. 
Uh, he had about three days to read this before voting on it. He's one of the ones that voted no, nay, as they call it. Um, yeah, it's a disgusting collection of uh, an enormous amount of stuff. I just you just go through and pick out examples like, you know, a million dollars for the New York City LGBTQ plus museum. Uh, just an example of where your tax bills are gone. Uh, I tr I provided a translation of omnibus bill. Uh, I think that should be called a financial gang rape. Um, 4,155 pages. Oh, pardon me. It was 3 million for the LGBTQ plus museum. Um, Anyway, welcome to 2023, taxpayers. Watch your ass when Congress is in session. Uh, there was a uh, one good bill, though, and we find this one, um, the Read the Bills Act. Uh, this, of course, didn't go anywhere. It's an interesting idea. This was proposed by Rand Paul multiple times. He's tried it again this year, tried it last year. Uh, the bill requires reading a bill before you pass it. Um, Believe me, they did not even allow this to get to the floor for a vote. They wouldn't let it get even close to that. Uh, but what uh, Rand Paul is trying to get them to do is that they actually have to read the bills before they pass them. Uh, that's an interesting concept. Uh, it would cut down on the 4,155 page stuff. So this this would fall into the good category if anybody cared about it. I have it in my bad list and I'm doing the bad stuff first because no one cares about this. They couldn't even get it get it through. Um, but this would require a full reading of the bill um, in Congress and the Senate uh, before they're allowed to vote on it. That's an interesting one. Um, anyway, uh, that languished again. Another thing I want to bring up uh, that happened, inflation. Everybody knows that. Uh, I did a show on that, um, wrote some articles. Uh, Inflation is expansion of the money supply that's caused by the four trillion plus budgets that Congress passes. House of Representatives is responsible to pass the bills, show the to write the funding bills and pass them. Um, the Senate may offer amendments from time to time. Uh, they're not actually they don't really have authority that we give them. And the president does sign it and can veto it. That's the way I've been doing it. But uh, even that is more a habit than than actually required. But anyway, um, they've been spending four trillion or so a year of money they do not have. And the place where they get it, one of the places where they get it is through the Federal Reserve printing money, quote unquote printing. So there was a lot of that going on last year and the year before. And that's why eggs cost more. So that's part of the 2022 story is that our grocery bills are up, our car bills are up, our gas bills are up. All the bills are up. What actually happened is that eggs are worth the same amount. There's the same amount of chickens in the United States, roughly, laying eggs. It's not like half the chickens died, and that's why eggs are twice as much. What happened is the U.S. dollar is not worth what it was a year ago. That's what happened in 2022. The value of the dollar dropped. The cost of eggs didn't really go up. It's just that a printed fiat dollar is not worth as much. That's why we need to switch to something sound like, say, silver coins as it says in the Constitution. All right, I want to get into that rant. Um, another thing uh, that I wanted to bring up is COVID. So this is also in my bad list. The whole COVID farce uh, and the big pharma team, it's still going. Uh, they're talking about wearing masks. I heard in New Jersey schools are wearing masks again. You watch uh, in December, Tony Fauci, Mr. Science himself, did a interview on face the nation, uh, he said, you know, we're still in a pandemic and schools may require masking because of the uh, Christmas gatherings. And you certainly need to be tested for COVID before you could have dinner with, say, half a dozen of your family members at the holidays. Uh, that would be too risky. So the farce is still going on. Um, the CDC changed the definition of a vaccine. Uh, I want to bring that one up. Um, they, the, the definition... Uh, was uh, this is myocarditis? Somebody's gonna find this one. I got a bunch of stuff in here. Read the bills. Maybe I forgot that one. Anyway, the CDC changed the definition of a uh, vaccine. It used to be a vaccine provided immunity. That's what the word has meant since it was invented as a word and since vaccines were invented. But now they change the definition because they want to promote the the vaccines. One thing that has come out this year 
is the risk of the vaccines. So uh, here's an article by Dr. Peter McCullough. He's one of the ones that's been exposing this. Um, the interesting one, we just saw one in the Bills game. I think it was the Bills. Some sports, soccer or football or something. Football was. Um, perfectly healthy, vaccinated guy collapses on the field with a heart attack. Uh, he's still alive. Best wishes to him. But unfortunately, the NFL required him to get shots. Now, I don't know if the shots are related, but it's coming out uh, more and more. So this is getting exposed. 2022 had a lot of exposures of the athlete deaths, for example. Um, Dr. McCullough went back and looked at cardiac arrests in mainstream athletes. Like He counted 1,519 cardiac arrests since the shots were started, the COOF shots. 1,100 and one of those died. To find that count, Dr. McCullough had to go back over a 38 year period to find that many. So there's something unusual going on with athletes and myocarditis, various forms of cardiac arrest, cardiac disease, dropping dead or collapsing on the field while playing with mostly younger males, 20s, talking professional college and professional athlete level people. Uh, these are people in top physical condition. Heart disease is not a common thing. Cardiac arrest is not a common thing in that group. 1,519 since the shots were started. All right. That's enough of the bad stuff. Um, in the good stuff, uh, distrust of government is on the rise, big time. So the amount of normies this year that have reversed their position on government and started saying like, uh, maybe the government is lying to us. Uh, I don't trust the government. Uh, that is on the rise big time in 2022. Uh, social media, my anecdotal social media um, analysis would be that a lot more normies are wary of the government now. Uh, COVID was part of it. This Ukraine war thing was part of it. Uh, other other things. Nancy Pelosi is part of it. The whole cabal, Joe, President Joe, like how did he get in? And who's really running Washington, D.C.? And what are they up to? Um, anyway, the normies, I mean, us skeptics here, uh, we already didn't trust the government, right? But the normies now are are coming on board with this. This is a good thing. That's why I have this in the good and beautiful section that I'm going to do second. Um, this is beautiful. People are looking at Washington, D.C. and saying, I don't believe you. Um, you're full of shit, right? So anyway, distrust is is now on the rise. Uh, here's another uh, article I wrote this year. Um, Dr. Fauci is exposed wide open. People, the, the hashtag Nuremberg 2 is uh, trending on Twitter. Like, People people think this guy should be tried, convicted, and given the appropriate penalty, with Nuremberg being the model. Um, so uh, I made a list here. Uh, this is the top 10 of COVID misinformation from Tony Fauci. Uh, this is pretty widely known now in 2022. Again, the normies know this stuff. I'm just going to read through the list. Um, here, here's an, here's a... Uh, uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn quote, uh, it's a great one. It really does explain what a lot of people in, in the United States and around the world are seeing this year. We know they are lying. They know they are lying. They know we know they are lying. We know they know we know they are lying, but they are still lying. It's true. So here's the top 10 from Fauci. Uh, MSMDM, remember the new Department of Homeland Security, an acronym invented? Um, in 2022, with their National Terrorism Advisory System Bulletin, MDM is the abbreviation. That's now a terroristic threat to the U.S. Uh, per the Department of Homeland Security. False and misleading narratives and conspiracy theories have and will continue to contribute to a heightened threat of violence in the United States. So I said, OK, let's go with that. Let's look at some of the major sources of this mal, dis, and misinformation. Uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci. Uh, it was difficult to get this down to 10, um, but anyway, I worked at it and worked at it. 
And I narrowed this down to 10 MDM from Fauci. Where's my list? Um, here it is, the top 10. Number 10, vaccine prevents the spread of COVID. Nah, we all know that's bullshit. Uh, no, uh, Anthony Fauci said um, it's within our capacity to prevent, yes, another surge from hitting the country as long as more people get vaccinated. Now, we know that's not true. If you want to keep the spread as low as possible, get us back to that level of normality. You have to get those people vaccinated. Now, everybody in 2022, or most people, I'll say not everybody. Most people, no, that's not true. Um, here's the facts. Now, a lot of people died. Uh, number nine, Fauci misinformation. Children must get vaccinated. Now, as it turns out, it's actually not a good idea. Uh, children are not at risk. I won't go through the data, but I have it in this article. We'll post the links on the website. Healthy people must be locked down to end the pandemic from Tony Fauci. Um, I won't bother to read the quote, but no, that one's not true. Uh, we know that now. Physical separation of six feet is critical to prevent the spread. Now, that was a number somebody pulled out of their butt. Um, it, there's zero science behind that. But the science, Dr. Fauci is behind it. Now, it doesn't matter whether you're six feet or 60 feet indoors, the air circulates, the risk is the same. Um, Fauci said, well, we have to draw a line somewhere. Uh, yeah, that's not how science works, Mr. Science. Um, right, here's a picture. This is the six feet apart from our president and vice president. Uh, I think this was the inauguration, but uh, maybe it wasn't 2022. But anyway, this was the the farce that people, a, a large number of people, I don't have the stats, but in my circles, it's pretty much everybody that I talk to um, that I'm interested in talking to for more than like uh, how much are these eggs. Um, they recognize that this is just silly. You look at this and they just laugh. These people with their masks on, sitting six feet apart, all of whom are vaccinated and boosted, by the way, in their blue formal outfits. Um, is this an IQ problem or is it a religion problem? Uh, it's one of those two. I think it's some of both. Depends on the people. Um, where am I at? I, I didn't mean to take this long on this list. I got a lot of backup here. Go read this article on uh, on Safe Space if you would like more information. Um, but I just want to keep going down through here. I think I missed one. Number four, hydroxychloroquine does not work and is dangerous. Nope, that's not true. Look at the Mercola, Dr. Mercola protocol. Uh, actually, it turns out uh, that is a good thing. I have you know, talked to somebody visiting here from Brazil. They're like, it's stupid to come to the United States without hydroxychloroquine. Before you go to the um, airport, you just stop by the drugstore. It's an over-the-counter drug. It's widely used for malaria and a lot of other things, and it's effective against COVID if you take it early. So um, yeah, most of the world uh, saw that a lot earlier, but Americans now get it. Um, number three, ivermectin did not work and is dangerous. Same deal. I think that's the one they call the horse drug, right? Uh, yeah, it does work on horses. Horses are mammals. So there are some drugs that work on horses as well as humans, uh, but it's not a horse drug. Uh, Fauci, again, lying to us. And people recognize it in 2022. Um, number two, NIH did not fund gain-of-function research at the Wuhan lab. Uh, that's out. Uh, everybody knows that one now. Um, oh, yes, they did. Uh, here's This is a great uh, cartoon. Center for Vial, Viral Pathology. Uh-oh. This was this was years and years ago. Um, that one's a pretty good one. How did they know? Number one, the virus could not have come from the Wuhan lab from Fauci. All right, let me move on from that. The whole farce was exposed, um, Couchy. So I put this in the good category because this is people recognizing that can't trust the government, can't trust Fauci, can't trust the government. Um, all right, next one I'll bring up. Permitless carry states. We've got five more permitless carry states in 2022, uh, also known as constitutional carry. This is a civics class. I'm not going to call it that because the Second Amendment doesn't grant a right to carry. Uh, it doesn't actually even apply to the states unless you buy into that Supreme Court invention of the incorporation doctrine. The Second Amendment says that the federal government is not allowed to infringe on the right to keep and bear arms. It doesn't say that you can carry in a state. That's a question for your state. And 
happily in 2022, five more states joined the ranks of states that recognize the right exists and don't require a permission slip from the government to carry. So the five are Georgia in uh, April 22, Indiana, July of 22, Louisiana, August of 22, um, Ohio in June of 22, and Alabama, January 1st, 2023, New Year's Day, there's took effect. Um, the oldest permitless carry state, I looked that one up, it's Vermont, Bernie Sanders state. That's interesting. Vermont's permitless carry program became effective on March 4th, 1791. That's 1791. In other words, Vermont has never had a license. Uh, if you've ever been to Vermont, it's not a center of murder and mayhem with gun deaths everywhere. Uh, it's actually the opposite. Uh, Vermont is one of the safest spots around. And for a lefty place, it's uh, really run by the, the progressives. Um, Burlington is uh, a, a heavy progressive left, um, which is why Bernie Sanders manages to get reelected. But the rest of Vermont, they don't know what to do with Bernie. Uh, the problem, as in a lot of states with Vermont, is that it's got one, it's got a major city, major by Vermont standards, um, which is pretty hardcore progressive left, liberal, and then the whole rest of the state, which is almost the whole state, which completely disagrees with that and drives around with a shotgun and a rack in the back of the truck. Um, but anyway, most of Vermont, I asked somebody in Vermont uh, how they thought Bernie got into office. And he said, I have no idea. And I have no use for that son of a whore, I think was the term he used, um, an old guy. Um, anyway, uh, I had a map here. Let me find that down here. Permitless carry states. So uh, this is a good thing. So we're now, the green ones are states that do not require a permission slip from the government to carry. Um, my state of Florida is still red, but I actually spoke uh, last week with a state legislature. They th they think there's a good chance that it's going to pass this year. Um, it's under serious talk and has been for a while uh, in Florida to get rid of their carry permit program. Uh, it would actually make it uh, fit in with the um, Florida Constitution, which Article 1, Section 8 of the Florida Constitution uh, does not allow the state to issue a permit. So that should go through. But anyway, uh, we're uh, more than halfway through uh, with this. So that's a good thing this year. Um, uh, what else? Uh, I had the Mises Caucus takeover of the Libertarian Party. Um, hold on one second. I'm going to shut my door. Okay. Sorry, all the background noise, folks. Um, shut the office door there. The uh, the Mises Caucus took over the Libertarian Party, so it's um it's a great thing. Uh, there's actually, if anybody's been following the Libertarian Party, I have. I'm not a member of any particular any political party. Never have been. Uh, I don't know if I ever will. But the Mises Caucus has actually made me think about it a little bit. I've never uh, been registered by a political party, except to vote in a primary in a place where it's required, and also by accident, because in uh, my previous state of New Jersey, if you voted in a primary when you were registered independent, they changed your registration on you. Um, so anyway, uh, the um, Mises Caucus is a group of actual libertarians. So imagine this, some libertarians actually took over the Libertarian Party. So. President Dave Smith, anyone? Uh, let's see what can happen with that. Um, next one I had, uh, the Twitter takeover. Um, the Twitter takeover is an interesting one uh, that the... Uh, hold, hold on. The um, Twitter has taken over um, by the richest guy in the world. And are we going to see uh, free speech? Uh, this has been fun. Uh, Twitter, for people that are on Twitter, uh, the last since since uh, Elon Musk got a hold of it and started firing large amounts of people and exposing what they're doing. Uh, Twitter has been a lot more interesting. You can say what you want now. Um, I'm spending more time on Twitter myself. Whether that's good or bad, I don't know. But the free speech part of it is good. 
Uh, the Twitter files are uh, fun to watch the effects of that. And people are just losing their hair uh, over all this stuff being exposed. Um, the latest one is uh, we found out that the FBI was having weekly meetings with Twitter on censorship, uh, who, which tweets to censor, um, which accounts to ban. It was a coordination meeting. Um, there's FBI employees inside Twitter. There's somewhere in the neighborhood of 75 FBI agents assigned full time to watch Twitter and decide who to ban. Um, this is all exposed. I have this in the good category because we know what the FBI is up to uh, with Twitter now. Um, that's all come out. And if Elon Musk had not bought in Twitter, bought Twitter, uh, we wouldn't know about that. Um, now, on the other side of this, will the progressives care about all this? Thomas St. Thomas from uh, Unsaved Space wrote, wrote uh, a great article on this. This is kind of the other view of this. So he, he called this why the Twitter files aren't the actual Twitter story. Uh, if you think the Twitter files will matter, you don't understand progressives. Um, so this is more of a view, not my civics view, where I'm talking about that the FBI is exposed and knowing that the government is actually violating uh, the First Amendment. Clearly, uh, it's another reason to shut down the FBI. It's unconstitutional anyway. There's no authorization for a police force by the federal government operating within state territory. Um, so, yeah, let's just close down the FBI. The good part of the Twitter is that it's another piece of information saying we could. We should. Anyway, but the point here about will progressives care? I'm going to go right to the conclusion. Uh, Tom said, Tommy says, I appreciate the sentiment and the reporting done by these independent journalists, but I'm not hopeful that it will make a difference. Progressivism, progressivism doesn't care. And when progressives are in charge, why should they bother? So that's the other side of the Twitter story that the people that you would think would wake up and say, oh, no, what's going on? Um, they actually don't care about this. It doesn't really fit in with their the way they think of the world. So it doesn't matter. Um, if the FBI's goal was good, which by good, that's a, uh, a moral judgment. Like if that, if they consider the goal good, then any means are fine. So, you know, 75 FBI employees assigned to censor Twitter based on politics. That's all fine. There's nothing wrong with that. So I, uh, I might be horrified by that. Most progressives, shrug their shoulders and just say, okay, that is what my tax money is for. Anyway, uh, Twitter's a good thing though, overall. Um, next one I'm going to bring up in 2020, Roe v. Wade was overturned. Um, that's a good one. That's a total exposure of the judicial activism from 50 years ago of the um, original Roe v. Wade decision, which was a bunch of judges, guys that wear their black bathrobes to work, sitting high up above everyone else as if they make the decisions for the whole 330 million of us. Um, it's them playing legislature, playing uh, political activist, uh, passing uh, and offering a majority opinion that the country follows that really is just legislation. So the original Roe v. Wade case should have never been taken by the Supreme Court. Uh, it isn't in their jurisdiction. Constitution limits the cases that federal courts can take, including the Supreme Court, uh, abortion isn't, isn't, that's a state's thing. The federal government has no authority either way. Uh, and the Supreme Court has no authority either way on it. Murder is not a federal crime. I mean, that's not in the federal crime system. A lot of people might think that's funny, but that's not the purpose of the federal government. That's a state question. So making murder illegal and prosecuting it is a state matter. That's not a federal matter. Um, Unless a murder happens on a military base and maybe inside D.C. where Congress has authority, uh, it's not a question. So even if you consider abortion murder, uh, it doesn't matter. It's not a federal question either way. Now, the lefties are went insane over the concept that they get to decide the abortion question within their state. Like, that's not what they want. Uh, that part amuses me because the whole decision was just, well, this isn't a federal government matter. Uh, this has to go back to the states. But nope, that isn't what they want. Uh, they want one world government. Uh, the one United State, take the S off, is part of their goal. So 
anyway, the good part of this is that the majority of the current Supreme Court actually followed the Constitution. And they said it pretty clearly that you read read the majority opinion, like they totally call out the uh, court from 50 years ago that originally wrote the Roe v. Wade. Uh, the Republicans, of course, uh, who were making abortion supposedly a constitutional right, which is laughable. It's so ridiculous, it's laughable. But that's what they claimed. You get... Um, how a lawyer can say that with a straight face and knows anything about the Constitution and has the job of supporting the Constitution and swore an oath to uphold the Constitution, the whole thing's ridiculous. Anyway, uh, this reminded me of one of my favorite Michael Bolden quotes from the Tenth Amendment Center. Uh, Michael Bolden said, the Constitution means what the Supreme Court says it means until it changes its mind. He didn't say that about the Roe v. Wade, but it definitely applies. It's about a number of other things that the Supreme Court uh, should or has overturned. So the interesting thing with this one uh, on the good side of 2022, uh, will they overturn some other previous Supreme Court decisions? Uh, I thought of a couple. Uh, one is uh, Korematsu v. United States in 1944. That's a decision, a majority opinion, that it's constitutional for a president to put citizens in a concentration camp for years based only on their racial heritage. So that's a Supreme Court decision that still stands. Uh, if Biden wanted, he could put all Japanese heritage citizens in a concentrations camp and just say that it's constitutional because the Supreme Court said it is, and he would be correct. If you think the Supreme Court decides what's constitutional, then you also would agree that Japanese citizens were maybe male, white, cisgender, American citizens at this point can be put in a concentration camp for four years. Uh, another one, Buck versus Bell, that was 1927, that says that it's constitutional for the government to do sterilization of people based on their intellectual capability. So it is considered constitutional, according to the Supreme Court, for the government to do a forced sterilization against someone's will, because the government defines their intellectual capabilities not above some line. Uh, there's a dangerous one. That one still stands. Uh, another one more recent, 2005, was the Kilo versus City of New London. Uh, that's the one that says the government can take property from one private party and hand it over to another private party. And the reason that they were doing in this particular case, it's an eminent domain case, uh, is that they thought they could get more tax money from a different private party. So they stole the property and handed it to someone else. Uh, and by the way, they handed it to a mall developer and they never built the mall. It's now a vacant lot mess where it used to be a nice house by Susan Kilo. Anyway, that still stands too. So here's the question. Um, will they overturn those three? And there's a lot more. All right, next one I want to bring up, 2022 good things. Uh, the CIA, like, totally exposed. Uh, that's a fun one. Um, Tucker Carlson, mainstream news. It's now okay to talk about the CIA was involved in some capacity. We don't know exactly how much, uh, but Tucker had a, a show uh, in towards the end of 2022, about a month ago. Um, he had a source that chose to remain anonymous and they respected that from within the intelligence community that is privy to the documents from the Kennedy assassination. And he said, yes, the CIA was involved. Um, and now we can talk about that. Here's another uncovered DC article. Again, I'll put the uh, links in, in the show notes. They show up in a day or two. Um, there we go. Uh, it's out. Uh, it's coming out. Um, it's, it's okay to talk about on a prime time. Uh, the links in here, it's a short Tucker Carlson clip where he exposes it. Uh, the source said the answer is yes, I believe they're involved. The CIA's track record does not help the CIA's case as far as being involved in murdering a president. Of course, the CIA would kill other people's presidents. They've tried, if you believe the CIA, uh, the CIA has admitted trying to kill presidents, leaders. Um, Castro is one, uh, and there's others. Uh, they certainly, CIA certainly overthrows uh, they just did it in Ukraine on the way leading up to this war. Um, half, half a dozen countries in the Middle East they've been involved in. 
1956 or four, whenever it was, they uh, coordinated the overthrow of the democratically elected president of Iran and installed the Shah. Um, they certainly uh, took out uh, Afghanistan, Iraq. Um, they tried to do Syria, but that wasn't all that successful, but they're still trying with Syria. And now they're trying kind of with Russia. It seems like the Ukraine war, their agenda is regime change in Russia. Um, that's stupid, uh, risky, I guess I would say, as well as being stupid. Uh, but anyway, yeah, the CIA's track record does not help. So um, you all know the story. So anyway, Tucker Carlson summed it up that an insane, actually a crazy lone gunman shot the president. And then a day later, another crazy lone government uh, gunman shot the guy who shot the president, supposedly shot. Um, he was accused. Oswald was accused of shooting. Um, I did uh, my own summary here. I won't read this whole thing. But uh, overall, Oswald was an insane lone government who, gunman who didn't have any connection with any government, foreign or domestic. He killed the president as he happened to be driving by the place where the guy worked, why he happened to be in a great sniper spot high up in the air at a window on a floor where no one was there. Um, 45 minutes later, the insane lone guzman was walking down a residential street and he talked to a cop, former army veteran, uh, and then killed him. That's a funny way to hide. Um, but that is what led them to Oswald, supposedly. Uh, they found them. And so an hour after shooting the president, who was just driving in a motorcade, a random lone gunman who supposedly nobody knew anything about was high up in an, in an empty floor of a dusty book deposit repository, school book place. Um, and uh, an hour later, they had him in custody. That's pretty good. That's pretty good uh, for just a random assassination. Um, and then two days later, another crazy lone gunman unconnected with anybody uh, shot and killed the insane lone gunman who shot the president. The president's killer were pronounced dead in the same hospital. I'll just read this as far as my skepticism goes. Uh, this, is, this is something that came out coming out in 2022. New information. The CIA had the insane lone gunman, who was also a Marine marksman, by the way, on a list and was watching him. They knew he had gone to the Soviet Union, but they didn't know he was going to kill anyone. This is their story. The government has released 5 million pages of documents on the assassination as of December 2022. Yeah, I checked. Um, none of which show any involvement by anyone in the government. Now, I didn't check all 5 million pages, but that's the report. What's been released doesn't show any involvement by anyone in the government. But the CIA has thousands more assassination-related classified documents, it still refuses to release 59 years later. Everyone involved is dead. 30 years ago, there was a congressional mandate to release everything. Um, I just noted this. Uh, President George H.W. Bush is a former CIA director, but he didn't know anything about what the CIA involvement. So anyway, pardon my skepticism. Uh, Tucker Carlson compared it to getting hit by lightning and then Every member of your family also gets hit by lightning two days later. That's a weird one as far as this lone gunman story. Uh, I was listening to another CIA exposure. The uh, Yesterday's Scott Horton show had a great guest. Check that out. It is John Kirikow Ku. I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing that right. He's a former CIA agent. Uh, he pointed out from documents released by the CIA recently that Oswald was connected to the CIA. Oswald was paid by the CIA during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, he was involved in that, and he was under CIA pay, and that's uh, been that's clearly out in documents now. I don't have a link to the document. Um, he gets into the bad blood between the FBI and the CIA. It's part of the problem. Uh, he also related a story of uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who's ex you know, he's uh, been exposing the government. Um, this is a great book if you haven't read it yet. The Real Anthony Fauci by Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Um, anyway, he was talking about uh, the Kennedy assassination. So he was a kid. He was in school. His mom went to go pick him up after his uncle was shot. 
um, he got home and the director of the CIA was in his house talking to his father. Now, his father, Robert F. Kennedy Sr., was the attorney general and Jack Kennedy's brother. Um, he was the attorney general. The CIA director was there talking to him. Uh, young Bob Kennedy walked in on that conversation to hear his dad ask the director of the CIA, reported by Robert Kennedy. I kind of trust him. Uh, his dad asked him, was the CIA involved? Did the CIA do this? I think was the question. I remember I'm paraphrasing, but did the CIA do this? That's a funny question for an attorney general to ask the head of the CIA shortly after the president is shot by a crazy lone gunman. And Robert Kennedy reported that the on this podcast, I heard this um, from a former CIA guy. Robert Kennedy reported that the director of the CIA said, I have no idea who did this. That's an interesting answer. Maybe he did have no idea. That could be true. Another part of that story, um, and this is all coming out, 2022 is a good year for bringing out information on exposing the government. Um, why did the attorney general not actually do anything? Um, he didn't really, he didn't investigate this. So that's another interesting tidbit here that the attorney general, even knowing things like this, um, didn't really look into who shot his brother. Um, and even though you'd think if there was the CIA involved, uh, you think that protect would protect them, but no, somebody shot him a couple years later too. Sorry to be callous there to his son, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Um, but somebody shot him too. I guess another crazy lone gunman. I don't know. Anyway, that's all, that's all coming out. So in the good thing, the CIA is being exposed. So 2022 was a big year for exposing the CIA. Uh, before 2022, I didn't know, a lot of people didn't know that the CIA was involved in the 2014 overthrow of the government in Ukraine, the democratically elected president of Ukraine uh, escaped possible assassination sniper fire by a fake motorcade with his car that left his house. Meanwhile, he was escaping from a helicopter from uh, a nearby location and he went to Crimea by helicopter while his car was leaving his house with CIA trained snipers shooting at his car. Um, that's what the CIA was doing in 2014 when Victoria Nolan from the State Department handpicked a new president for Ukraine. They got him installed. Um, John Kerry, Victoria Nolan were in Ukraine during the overthrow and the, the coup. Um, CIA was kind of in the background coordinating all that. So, yeah, 2022 had a lot of CIA exposures. Uh, that was good. That was good. All right. Um, next thing I was bring up uh, nullification. So um, my last two I want to talk about is nullification and secession. So what is happening in 2022? A lot of normies uh, became got got themselves woken up to the idea that you can't trust the government, that there's a lot of cooperation, corruption and we need to do something. So nullification uh, had some big boosts here. If you're interested in nullification, um, check out the Tenth Amendment Center. Um, the uh, Michael Bolden does a show there, and Mike Meharry writes articles. Uh, they do a, they do a nullification report, the state of nullification, um, and what's going on uh, in in the uh, nullification movement. Um, so, yeah, check out the Tenth Amendment Center website and episodes. Um, one of the things that uh, we've been seeing for years that just had more progress is marijuana. So medical and recreational pot at this point is effectively nullified. The way that happened is the states just started various versions of legalizing it, um, first with medical and then with recreational and now you can be in a conservative location. I happen to live in a very red conservative area of Florida and there's medical marijuana places and you can get you can get um, CBDs in next to the to the grocery store. And um, yeah, it's that's nullified. So the states are just ignoring the federal government. And once enough states do it, uh, really, it only takes one big state doing it. Uh, the feds just 
don't have a, a leg to stand on. They can't really do anything. So uh, marijuana is eventually going to be removed from Schedule 1. Uh, they, they have to. They have to back down. Um, the, the states just say, we don't care what you think. And the federal government has to give up. Uh, the next thing that's happened in 2022, which is why I put this topic on the list, uh, Colorado passed a resolution on um, natural, what they call natural medicine, basically hallucinogens, psilocybine, if I'm pronouncing that right. Magic mushrooms is the name I remember it by. Um, magic mushrooms are legal in Colorado now. And there's other states thinking about it too. California uh, maybe is close or maybe they already did it. I don't know. Um, seems like that's going to be the next thing to get nullified as far as um, natural medicine, drugs, whatever you want to call it. Uh, anyway, plants derive things that you can put in your body that the federal government says uh, they should lock you up or kill you for doing. Um, yeah, they're being, uh, they're being nullified. Um, another thing that's being nullified that's really gaining a lot of traction is federal firearm infringements. Um, one example that I have a link of is the ATF sent a letter to the, um, to the states uh, on a, frame receivers. So what the ATF is saying is that a uh, they call it an 80%. So like, for example, you can buy a 80% firearm that is 80% to complete, and then it doesn't have a serial number on because it's not a firearm. And then you can finish it yourself. Um, might have to do some drilling and that sort of thing, but you can finish it and produce a firearm and maybe it has a serial number, maybe it doesn't. Um, anyway, they sent a letter saying that, nope, they now say that 80% uh, are actually firearms and can be regulated as a firearm, even though they can't actually shoot anything. So they sent a letter to all the FFL dealers, uh, the federal firearm license dealers. Now there's a separate subject that's in the bad column that there even is such a thing as a FFL uh, because there's nothing in Article 1 of the Constitution that allows Congress to regulate firearms in any manner. There's nothing in Article Two that that allows the uh, two and three that allows the courts to be involved, or that allows the president to have a three-letter agency like the ATF that can even do this. All that stuff un is unconstitutional. It's unlawful. It's illegal. But anyway, the thing does exist. We have FFLs. They sent a letter to all of them. But there's three states that are saying no. Um, so here's uh, this is one Michael Bolden episode uh, from the Tenth Amendment Center. This is the Tenth uh, Amendment Center YouTube channel. Um, yeah, Michael, Michael talks about, I think if I play it, it's, it doesn't have any sound. I have the sound turned on. Um, so he talks about the three States that have said no to this so far. And I think there'll be more, but Montana has HB 248. Uh, that's a non-cooperate. Like you can't use a state or local jail. Federal agents can't use state and local jails for any, um, federal firearm, any unconstitutional firearm uh, restriction legislation um, and inf enforcement. Uh, and it has to be a state law too. So unless they're enforcing something that's also a state law, then they can't help. No cooperation, no finance, can't use the jails. Um, another state that's doing it is Missouri. Uh, it has what they call the Second Amendment Preservation Act that bans participation, same kind of thing. Third state is Arizona. They ban personal and financial help uh, on federal firearms that isn't part of stated federal law. So uh, this is this is a form of nullification, and they're doing it on firearms, which is a step up from just doing it in uh, uh, with um, marijuana legislation. So yeah, that's good. Good to see. Glad to see that. The um, this is in with the. You know, the the carry, like they've been talking about stopping the carry. Uh, Michael Bolden has a great quote that kind of sums up this, um, this strategy, which is you, you, if the state and local law enforcement does not participate with ATF, FBI, Homeland Security, uh, what, whatever, it works for all sorts of different things, drug enforcement agency. If the local and the state law enforcement don't participate, they can't really do anything. Uh, they don't have the manpower. That's not how they're set up. The way they normally operate is as a team. They they'll they bribe them with money. They'll bribe your local government with money, 
And then they use the local police to actually do most of the dirty work. Uh, there might be one ATF guy there too. That's normally how they do it. That's how the DEA operates often. Uh, when they capture somebody, uh, they need a local jail to put them in. They don't have federal jails all over that they can use. Uh, they can't extradite them. Uh, he has to be formally extradited if they catch somebody. So if they can't put them in jail, they can't take them out of the state. Uh, it makes it very difficult uh, for them to do anything. So this whole strategy, Michael Bolden sums up as um, teams don't really work when half the team quits. So if half the team quits, federal government's screwed. Uh, if you want to stop the ATF from infringing on the right to keep and bear arms, really all you have to do is get your sheriff on board. Uh, you don't need anybody else. If the sheriff won't help in your county, um, and this is if you don't don't live in a city where they have a police force, uh, same thing for police chief, although that's harder. But uh, specifically with the sheriff, it's easier because the sheriff is a constitutional office that doesn't really answer to the township mayor and council the way a city cops do, the chief of police does. If the sheriff's on board, the ATF can't really do anything because uh, the sheriff can arrest them. Uh, he, he's the highest law enforcement in the county. So anyway, that's um, that's a good thing, all that nullification. All right, yeah, watch some of Michael Bolden's show if you want to. This particular one was entirely on this um, frame receivers uh, case. So uh, all right, the next thing I was going to bring up, um, this is another great one. Really happy to see this. The House adjourned uh, yesterday. Uh, they're, they're restarting at noon Eastern today, which uh, was an hour ago. Uh, I'll end soon. Looks like I'm almost an hour into this. Um, they had three votes for a Speaker of the House without finding one. Uh, this hasn't happened in a century. Um, it's it's only been something like 10 times total that they've had to do a, a second vote ever. Uh, they normally don't have a problem picking the Speaker of the House. The cool thing about this is the Speaker of the House is an off is a it's a constitutional setup. It's not supposed to be partisan in the Constitution, but there is a Speaker of the House office required in the Constitution. The Speaker coordinates what's going on. The speaker does it normally, isn't supposed to participate in the debates. Um, it just uh, the Speaker's role is to run the meeting. It's it's almost like the way a um, you know the, the the president of a board of directors would kind of run things, organize who gets to talk next. Uh, that's the that's what the Speaker does. They've turned it into a partisan office where they've made the speaker uh, the top party member. Um, but that isn't really what the case is. And if you look at the titles, even when you have you know a major party, Nancy Pelosi, say, was speaker of the House. But the leader of the majority party is the next office down. Like the speaker of the House is not officially the leader of the party. Uh, it's the next office. Anyway, they adjourned uh, without picking a speaker. That's a good thing. It means that the House of Representatives can't get anything done. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm hoping they spend the next six months arguing over who the speaker is. This would be a great thing. Uh, good news. Yeah. All right. The last uh, good news I'm going to um, cover before I close out is uh, secession is openly being discussed. 2022 was a big change online and even sitting in a bar talking to people and, and family gatherings. Uh, I hear people bringing up secession, uh, national divorce. Uh, you can now openly talk about secession now. There's books coming out. This is an Allo Axelman book I just got, Articles of Secession. Uh, this Sunday, a little plug for Unsafe Space. Um, if you want to watch uh, on YouTube or Rumble or Odyssey, Facebook Live, uh, we're doing a book club episode on the Tom Woods book national divorce, peaceful solution for irreconcilable differences. So secession, national divorce, uh, breaking up, states splitting in half, this is becoming mainstream talk. Um, so I wanted to uh, just list kind of a shout out really to a couple of movements that you see in 2022 getting a lot of traction. Texas, Texas is a big one. You got Daniel Miller, he's running for a state office. Uh, you know, Daniel Miller as governor could move this forward a lot. Um, he's the guy who wrote the book Texit. Uh, he's 
the um, head of the Texas secession movement, Texas independence movement. The Republic of Texas has already been independent. It was independent for 10 years uh, before it joined the United States after it seceded from Mexico. Uh, Texas was part of the secession from Spain when it was a state uh, with Mexico in the early 1800s uh, and then 1820, 30, somewhere around there. Uh, Texas seceded from Mexico, became the independent Republic of Texas. Then 10 years later, Texas joined the United States. So Texas already knows how to do this. If you say collective history, their ancestors did it. Um, Texas has a lot of advantages. It's 30 million people. Uh, it's got a huge uh, GDP. It would be somewhere in the like 10th in the world. I don't remember the number off the top of the head, but Texas would be one of the biggest GDP countries in the world as its own country. It's got a big sea border with lots of trade. It's got an independent energy grid, has a huge land border with the United States for land-based trade. It's got a big border of Mexico for land-based trade, the other direction with a different company country. Uh, all good stuff. Um, in Texas, children are taught the Texas uh, Pledge of Allegiance in school, just as much as they are taught the U.S. one. Drive around Texas, you often see the Texas flag and the U.S. flag on separate poles flying at equal heights. Um, and it's not uncommon to drive by a place that just has the Texas flag. They don't have a U.S. flag up. Um, a lot of government buildings in Texas display the Texas flag and the U.S. flag together. Uh, this idea of the big U.S. flag and the smaller Texas flag, that's not as much a thing in Texas as it is in, say, New York, where the New York flag is a little tiny thing underneath the U.S. one. Um, yeah, that's Texas. So shout out to the Texas movement. A New Hampshire exit. New Hampshire's like they had a bill in the state house, something like 10 state representatives voted in favor of putting a referendum to the population, general population on a ballot. Uh, should Texas, should New Hampshire leave the union? form an independent state. Um, there was a huge uh, brouhaha that, you know, people claim that any representative, state representative that voted in favor of putting the resolution to secede to the people, uh, they would be like run out of office. But as it turns out, pretty much all of them got reelected. So it didn't actually even hurt their, their elections. So um, that's going to embolden uh, a lot of state representatives or already has. And so next time that goes to the state, to the floor, you know, in the uh, state legislature in New Hampshire, uh, there's going to be a lot more people that are not afraid to speak up and say, yeah, maybe we should at least let the people decide this. Um, Florida, uh, I'm now one of the admins on the Flexit page, Florida Exit. Uh, there's a little bit of traction. We're seeing some movement here in Florida. Florida's got 22 million it's got some of the advantages of Texas, not quite as big, but uh, easy to uh, ship stuff in and out of here. Um, so Florida, Florida's moving, um, could be another one, but I would expect, you know, Texas, New Hampshire first. Uh, we got California. There's two different active uh, Cal exit. Uh, one is the whole state splits off and forms an independent country. Um, I did a secession roundtable on Rebel Civics uh, a couple weeks ago with the head of uh, the Cal Exit 2 movement that is looking to separate uh, the whole state and form an independent union. Uh, there's another Cal Exit, yes, California movement. They, they're confusing a little because they use some of the same names, um, but they're talking about splitting California into halves. The left half, physically left and also politically left, would form a new union. That's basically the Cal Exit uh, that I talked about earlier. And then a second, the whole eastern part and the entire northern part of California would become a new state. Uh, they're talking about the name like New California, I think is one of the possibilities. Uh, they become a new state in the United States. And they're kind of a you know Republican leaning, right, politically right, conservative, uh, gun nuts, you know, that type. Um, they believe in the Constitution and freedom and um, le leaving people alone to do what they want. They're not uh, they're not the socialist. California values is a term that uh uh, Marcus had used in the round table. Um, so uh, there's that going on in California. There's also the um, state of Jefferson, which is a movement in Northern California to form a new state called Jefferson, the state of Jefferson, which would be a politically right, conservative, independent Jeffersonian tradition, uh, constitutionalist 
uh, part of the United States. So um, get a comment here. Laredo is the largest land port in North North America. Um, yeah, yeah, there's there's a lot of trade that can happen out of these states. They're not going to be isolated. Um, so Sanjay said that. Uh, then there's uh, one more thing I'm just going to bring up. Um, no, I got two more. Uh, we got Greater Idaho, uh, another whole movement. So this is this is a secession. It's not a forming a new state version of secession, but it's a form of self-governance. So I'm going to throw it in this good things going on this year category or in 2022. Uh, the red counties in Oregon, they're counties who have voted to join Idaho. Um, this is not uh, this hasn't been on mainstream news a lot, but this is half of Oregon. Uh, more by area, have voted to join Idaho. Uh, Idaho is basically on board with this. Um, they want to get rid of, they want to leave the the whole Portland crowd. Um, people that have watched the news in 2022 and 2021, uh, Portland is, is crazy. Um, these people want to separate from Portland. Uh, there's one county right on the Idaho border, Wallowa, Wallowa uh, that they're... Um, they're voting next. Uh, and there's a couple in that same area that haven't voted yet. Um, so anyway, this is the greater Idaho movement. There's also counties in Northern California and there's counties in Eastern Washington that could uh, join in this. So greater Idaho uh, could possibly become a big state, uh, a really big state. Um, if Idaho gets like half of Oregon, a third of or half of state of Washington and the top, you know, quarter or so of California, which is long-term possibility, uh, greater Idaho would be uh, quite a state. Um, it would it would end up uh, being uh, a big land mass and a lot of people and have a, um, they would get more representatives, uh, a lot more representatives in, the, in that side. So there's that movement. Um, one last thing I wanted to touch on, uh, this is America's United for Peaceful Separation. Now this has been around since before 2022, but I found out about it in 2022. So you guys are hearing about it in my summary. This is a group uh, originally formed by Stephen Axelman out of New York, um, coordinating and bringing together various secession movements within the United States. So this is this is a group to to share tips and help. Um, they promote the uh, separation of California in a separate state to be a liberal leftist paradise. They promote New Hampshire um, leaving and becoming a constitutionalist from the Jeffersonian tradition. Uh, Texas, the Texas movement with Daniel Miller, um, promote that and bring all these different groups together. So this is a uh, interesting page to check out. It's called America's Americans United for Peaceful Separation. Um, and there's links there. You can click on Texas, click on California, New Hampshire, Vermont, Greater Idaho, um, and Florida, my state of Florida. So uh, I'm going to close out with this one, that there is um, a pretty strong movement in 2022 towards secession. Um, I got one question from Sonia. Is this feasible? Can this actually happen, Greater Idaho? Uh, well, feasible uh, I need uh, a little more specifics. As far as the Constitution goes, the Constitution bars a state from forming within a current state without permission of Congress and the state. So for the counties at the county level, uh, within the provisions of the U.S. Constitution that we're bound by basically as members of the union, to do this, the counties would petition the legislature of Oregon the legislature of Idaho and the U.S. Congress. Uh, I don't know if it's a House or Senate, but Congress has to agree. If all three of those agree, then Idaho line can be moved to include those counties. Now, if you want to back up a little further, San, Sanjay, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, the Declaration of Independence says that they can leave. So the process that I would recommend them doing it if if they, if they want to, I, I don't object. This is all great. If if they petition the legislature of Oregon, petition the legislature of Idaho, petition Congress, and the three say yes, that's a nice, clean way to do it. That's a great way to do it. Um, and they're not talking about forming their own state. They're talking about 
um, joining another state that's already existing. So another way to do this is to follow the Declaration of Independence. So the Declaration of Independence is lays out the principle of self-governance. So a second way to do this, if they did get resistance, like which they might, the Oregon legislature might not agree. Uh, from what I've heard, the Idaho legislature is basically on board. They're, it hasn't been voted on because there's not a specific proposal, but uh, there's a lot of movement in Idaho to do this and expand Idaho. Um, and the people in that little strip of Idaho and the, uh, like, they're a lot like the people in Northern, Northeastern Oregon, Eastern Oregon, Eastern Washington. It's, it's, it's a lot of the same, same kind of area, mountainous, um, kind of a lot of rural area. The cities there are not as far left as like Portland and Seattle, not even close. Um, so, you know, you could see this happening, um, Anyway, the other way to do this, if there's resistance or refusal from Congress, from Idaho, and from the Oregon legislature, uh, and if California, part of California is included, the California legislature, if eastern part of Washington is included, state of Washington, then the Washington legislature, uh, is you just secede from the union and you form an independent country. So what they could do the counties could do within the constitution. This is not banned in the constitution. They could leave the union entirely, form a new country. And then if they wanted petition to join the United States as a new state, they would become a territory and then a state. Once they were in the United States as a new state, if they wanted to join with Idaho, now the Washington state has no say either way about that. They only need permission of the Idaho legislature and Congress. And maybe they could join as a territory uh, and then become part of Idaho. Um, I'll just point out that the way West Virginia was formed should have been done that way. Um, if I was uh, around, I would have told West Virginia, like, why don't you do this legally, constitutionally, lawfully, is what I mean, is that the counties of West Virginia that seceded from the state of Virginia, they were seceding from the Confederate States of America. Like, like th the state of Virginia left by majority of vote and joined a different union. They were part of the CSA. So West Virginia, um, it's it's not a big farming area. Uh, it's rural, mountainous. They're really like Western Maryland, um, Western Pennsylvania in the mountainous parts. Uh, they, they were not on board with this whole moving to the CSA. Um, what they should have done is, is form their own country, then join the United States as a territory and petition to be a state. That would be constitutional. But, you know, Lincoln supported secession. Lincoln's 100% aboard on secession as long as it fit his agenda. Uh, when West Virginia was formed, though, they didn't do it that way. They just declared that Virginia never left the Union, which was a lie. It's part of the Lincoln myth. And they created this new state of Virginia against the Constitution. There's a section in, um, in the Constitution that lays out that bans a state from doing that, the Virginia legislature did not give permission to West, the West Virginia, to the counties of Virginia that formed West Virginia to leave the state. They weren't even asked. Uh, so no, that was not not done constitutionally. Um, Greater Oregon could do it constitutionally. So anyway, uh, yeah, somebody says mm, that's been tried once, I think. I assume that's a reference to the war for Southern independence. Uh, to put it that way is the point that force decides moral questions. Um, so if you have a moral disagreement with your wife and she wants to leave, you could just punch her in the face and tell her she has to stay. That's basically the same, same. Issue. So sure. Some women have tried to leave their husbands and gotten beaten up for it and uh, ended up staying. Um, so yeah, that has been tried before, but in general, if I, had a uh, female friend that whose husband was abusing her, I would advise her to leave, uh, even though he might uh, beat her up. It's just a matter of how you advise her to leave. Same thing applies to a state. Uh, it's not actually a different moral question. And the Declaration of Independence explains all this. So uh, anyway, um, I'm going to close that here. So I had uh, more things on the good list for 2022 uh, than I did on the bad list. So um I'll look through the chat after I'm done. Uh, I didn't keep up while I was doing all that. But anyway, 
thanks everyone for listening and I'll see you next week on Rebel Civics. And for anybody that's coming to the book club on Sunday, uh, again, I'm just a reminder, it's Tom Woods, um, national divorce, the peaceful solution to irreconcilable differences. I'm the uh, book club advocate and the host. Uh, we got a bunch of great guests, including uh, the head of CalExit 2. I've uh, got a guy from Brazil who's part of the Brazil secession movement. Um, we have uh, somebody from Americans United for Peaceful Independence talking about coordinating. Um, we may have somebody from the New Hampshire secession movement and uh, a guy from the Florida movement, um, part of the uh, Flexit uh, Facebook group. So anyway, uh, I'll uh, see those of you come Sunday. And if not, I'll uh, see you next week on Rebel Civics. So thanks for watching. This production was made possible through the generous support of our members. To join our community, visit unsafespace.com. Unsafe Space is an online publication for individualists interested in subverting authoritarianism and ushering in the next enlightenment. For biting analysis and nourishing composition, or to sign up for our weekly news brief, The Abstract, visit unsafespace.com. Thanks for joining us today. Warning, this is an unsafe space. Dangerous ideas have been detected. The content of this production has not been authorized for distribution on Apple devices. The following co-conspirators are hereby uninvited to Klaus Schwab's Winter Solstice Party. Please be advised that CBS News has paused activity on unsafe space while it continues to assess security. Central Bank Digital Currency is a safe and secure way to protect you from Sam Bankman Freed. If you think about it, no one should be allowed to express opinions. But don't. Think about it, I mean. That's not your job. Thinking has been scientifically proven to be less efficient than compliance. Science scientific, and scientifically are registered trademarks of the World Economic Forum. Unauthorized use is prohibited. Computer voice Curtis, never mind, that last line is misinformation. Please disregard it and return to your safe space immediately. There will be cake. <laughs>